There were thousands and thousands of them, and they believed, they knew, that the land belonged to them. For as long as anyone could remember, they'd farmed, fished, and hunted on this land. They knew every inch of it. Their ancestors were buried there. But now, powerful outside forces were threatening to take their land. And in short order, they did take the land. A process of dispossession that destroyed the people's community and culture that was so intimately connected to the land. Sound like a familiar story? Well, maybe not. Because we're not talking about Native Americans or former slaves here. Nope. In this case, we're talking about tens of thousands of white residents of Appalachia and the great, wrenching dispossession that began in the late 19th century, courtesy of the coal industry. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more... Your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody's free until everybody's free. The government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. History matters because it's not just about the past. History's about us, here and now. It explains the world we live in and why things are the way they are. And history gives us insights into how to achieve a more just, peaceful, and prosperous future. So people, let's do this. Hello, everyone. Welcome to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. I'm host Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, and this is In the Past Lane, episode 50, in which we talk to historian Stephen Stoll about his new book on the history of Appalachia. We are coming to you this week from the Moonshine Studios, located in central Massachusetts. You can learn more about me, this podcast, and our guests at our website, inthepastlane.com, and on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and our YouTube channel. Leading us up the mountains and down into the valleys is our exemplary executive producer, Lulu Spencer. So, what's happening this week at In the Past Lane? Well, I'm still on semester break for another week, so this is about the time when us professors begin to set aside the stuff that we've tried to catch up on over the break. The things you just can't get to during the semester, like writing, research, and, yes, podcasting. Any day now, I'll have to shift into full-on syllabus writing, scanning and posting readings, crafting assignments, and all that. I'm really looking forward to this semester. I'll be teaching three classes. One is a continuation of my freshman seminar on the history of social justice movements in America. Another is my Irish American experience course, a perennial favorite at a place like Holy Cross where I teach, since it's safe to say that at least half the student body, if not more, has some Irish heritage in them. And I'm also teaching a course on the Gilded Age and Progressive Era that's called Teddy Roosevelt's America. And guess what the big project is for this class? That's right, my scholars will be making podcast episodes some of which are likely to make their way into future In the Past Lane episodes. But the big news is that In the Past Lane has reached episode 50. Woohoo! That's an important milestone. If you look at podcasts at iTunes or what they now call Apple Podcasts, you'll see more than 250,000 podcasts. That's right, a quarter million podcasts. But here's the deep, dark secret. Most of these podcasts are no longer active. The podcasters behind them have given up. In the industry, it's what's called pod fading. Given how much time it takes to make a really good podcast, I totally get why so many people podfade. But not me. Especially if you tell your friends about In the Past Lane and say nice things about it on Twitter and Facebook and so on. And if you're able to extend some financial support through our Patreon button, which you'll see at inthepastlane.com. Every little bit helps, so thanks so much. Episode 50 also marks In the Past Lane's two-year anniversary. That's right, the first episode dropped in the third week of January 2016. Can you believe it, Lulu? Two years. Any thoughts you want to share with our listeners? Two-year anniversary? I mean, it's only felt like an eternity. Hmm. Such enthusiasm. Okay, people. Let's shift into four-wheel drive. We're heading for the Appalachian Mountains. Your journey in the past lane begins now. When I saw that Stephen Stoll had published a new book about the history of Appalachia, I just knew that I had to get him on the podcast. My interest in this book was piqued for a number of reasons. First, about a year ago, I spent a week in West Virginia, checking out student immersion programs, many of which focused on poverty, inequality, and social justice issues. 
It was an incredible experience. West Virginia is a beautiful region, and its people are so warm and generous. But it was also a shocking experience. The devastation wrought by poverty, the disappearance of jobs, and the opioid epidemic is inescapable. So too is the ongoing saga of energy extraction. Only these days, it's not so much about coal and more about fracking for natural gas. It's really hard to describe just how overrun much of the state of West Virginia is by fracking. Driving across the state, you see fracking wells everywhere, including near houses and schools, and pipelines run everywhere, up and over hills, under roadways, across valleys. It seems like big energy owns the state, just like it has for over a century. Any individuals or organizations that raise questions about the environmental damage being done and potential negative effects on public health are just ignored. The extraction just keeps on going, and nearly all the wealth that it generates leaves the state, leaving West Virginia where it's always been, one of the poorest states in the nation. So when I learned of Stephen Stoll's book, Ramp Hollow, The Ordeal of Appalachia, I knew that it would tell the important backstory to the situation. Essentially, what made Appalachia poor and why it stayed that way. The other reason why I wanted to talk to Stephen Stoll is that this backstory is precisely what's missing in the best-selling memoir Hillbilly Elegy written by J.D. Vance. Vance grew up in Appalachian poverty, but he managed to escape, went off to college, eventually Yale Law School, and then he went on to become a successful venture capitalist. It's a great, classic, rags-to-riches American story. But what's drawn a lot of criticism is Vance's glib assertions that Appalachian poverty, the poverty that he escaped, that it's essentially the fault of the people of Appalachia who are mired in a so-called culture of poverty. If only they'd get their acts together. You know, get educated work hard, sober up, they'd be able to escape their poverty, just like J.D. Vance. But what's missing in Hillbilly Elegy is any sense of how and why Appalachia became so poor. Well, that's where the book Ramp Hollow comes in. It chronicles the human choices that made Appalachia poor. So let's get to it. One more thing before we do. The title of Stoll's book, Ramp Hollow, refers to a place in West Virginia by that name. It's a landscape that vividly shows the history of dispossession and extraction that has shaped Appalachia for more than 150 years. All right, let's get to that interview. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. Okay, back at In the Past Lane, Edward T. O'Donnell here, your historian at large, and with me now is historian Stephen Stoll. Stephen Stoll is a professor of history at Fordham University. He is the author of many books on topics related to the history of the environment, land use, social relations, and economics. These works include The Great Delusion, A Mad Inventor, Death in the Tropics, and the Utopian Origins of Economic Growth, and U.S. Environmentalism Since 1945, A Brief History with Documents, and Larding the Lean Earth, Soil and Society in 19th Century America. Stephen Stoll is with us today to talk about his latest work, Ramp Hollow, The Ordeal of Appalachia. Stephen Stoll, welcome to In the Past Lane. Thank you. Your book focuses on the region of Appalachia, a long expanse of the Appalachian mountain range running from states like Georgia, up through the Carolinas, Tennessee, Kentucky, into West Virginia, Virginia, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. And for well over a century, Appalachia has been associated with hillbilly poverty and white trash and and all that. And it's an incredibly poor and troubled region in many ways. In fact, it seems to be the place where the current opioid epidemic got its start. But what's missing in this portrait of poverty and despair, and what's missing in all the other times that Americans have sort of discovered Appalachian poverty, and I'm thinking in particular about Robert F. Kennedy's tour of the region in the 60s, is that there never seems to be any backstory to the poverty. There's no sense that this poverty and despair is the result of something. It just is. And listeners to this podcast know that one of my informal Ten Commandments of history is that history is the study of choices. Nothing just is. You know, everything has an origin point. Everything is the product of of human choices. And that seems to be at the heart of your book, this idea of choices and about decisions that are being made. So before we dive into the story of Appalachia as you tell it, Could you tell our listeners about this theme of choices and power that runs through your book? Well, I completely agree with you that at the center of the book, and not very many readers have have commented on it or have caught on to it, certainly very few of the reviewers who've taken it up so far 
And it is, just as you said it, that there's no backstory to the way that we understand poverty in general and Appalachia in particular. And I, I really think that there is a, there's a kind of unstated purpose about that, which is it's easier to understand something and treat it and decide how you think of it, about it if you can say that, oh, they've always been poor, that these people have always lived like this. You're never going to solve this problem. Right. Because inherent, you can fill in the blank of any people who you choose to talk about. Right, not just Appalachians. Especially if, if there's a kind of disdain, if there's racism that's operating. They've always been like this. And so nothing, nothing can be done. Don't you understand? You can't reason with a fill in the blank. In this case, a hillbilly. Yeah. If we actually look at the historical record, there are very concrete, very identifiable reasons for why Appalachia is in the state that it is in and has been since the late 19th century. So maybe we should circle back to that point and begin looking at this region by having you tell us about how Appalachia was populated in the 18th and 19th centuries by these white settlers who at the time were not seen as backward and you know people that were just out of step with modernization, but they were really seen as the quintessential American pioneers. Sure. You know, the people that fought the Indians, they cleared the land, they built log cabins. And I'm sure listeners are going to want to know more about these people and this remarkable agrarian world that you talk about, this agrarian world that they built that was based on self-sufficiency and a kind of a barter economy and a lot of land used in common. Tell us more about that. If you really want to go to Act One in the mountains, first of all, there's Shawnee and there's Cherokee and there's various groups of people. At the same time, in the 17th century, a Finnish and Swedish population of people who had extensive experience in the hard scrabble northern edge of Europe. These are people who were extremely adept at all the different skills and tasks having to do with living in a forest, in a cold world, in a high latitude world. They knew how to farm tough crops and they knew how to mix up a kind of hunting, gathering, and farming. These are the people who ended up leaving that Western Europe and heading over to uh, North America, where they settled, oddly enough, in the Delaware River Valley, just south of what is now Philadelphia. You don't think mm -hmm. of that as that is the hearth of the American backcountry. Right. But that's where we find the first log cabins. That's where the Swedes and the Finns likely learned what to plant burning practices from Delaware Indians. Right. Burning the underbrush and things that sort of fertilized the land, but also cleared the land, those kind of practices. Exactly. Swidden agriculture, where you clear land by fire, reducing all the biomass to its elements, and that's when you can plant. It's something that people have practiced, humans have practiced for millions of years, or for a million years, I should say. And so this is where the backwood settlement culture took shape here. And when they ran out of land and when their population got too high, it sort of popped and they spread out into New Jersey, onward into Pennsylvania, across Pennsylvania, dropping down into what is now West Virginia, what was Virginia. And they were always seeking places where they could get good hunting because they loved hunting. And hunting, I'm not a hunter, so I can't tell you exactly the thrill they got out of it, but I know that it was fun, it was exciting, and for the labor that you expend, if you could get a big animal, it really paid for the time and the energy. So they preferred to do that to farming wherever possible. We get from Davy Crockett and Daniel Boone, but especially Crockett, who said, I'm really a lousy farmer, I really hate farming, all I wanted to do was be a hunter. And I really think that he was speaking for an awful lot of people who felt the same way. So here they are in this very extensive world. There's very fertile soils, though they are at an incline. They're establishing their households. They're building log cabins. They have kin groups of linked households put together in different regions. People who needed each other for protection, needed alliances for when times were tough, needed to be able to share resources if that was food, if it was money, if it was skills or craft goods, anything. They learned how to stick together, even if that number of people could, in fact, get rather large. But this is the origin of a kind of kinship relationship 
that goes into the 20th century that also becomes part of the stereotype and the kind of sneer yes. of the hillbilly. These were very successful and essential strategies for survival in difficult circumstances that didn't seem well adapted to the world of the 20th century. And part of the, this world is this practice of self-sufficiency. And there's an economy there, but it's not a you know, modern market economy. So there's trade that's happening. There's exchange of goods and services and things. But it's a different kind of economy from the one that's going to emerge in the 19th and 20th century. Yeah. Let me say something about that. Absolutely. One of the things I wanted to write about in the book was I wanted to interpret the people of the Southern Mountains as an agrarian culture. Now, agrarian is an omnibus term that would include settlers, all peasants, all people who live very close to their environments, who farm and gather and make things at home, and who trade, that is, exchange for what they cannot make themselves. Integral to this is money. You know, you hear people, I teach a course on capitalism, and you ask someone, what is capitalism? They'll say, it's a market economy. Right. It's an economy where people exchange things. Yes, it is. But that's not what it is, essentially. It has to be a market economy. That's true. But that's not all that it is. In fact, market economies go back thousands of years. Market economies are as old as the first time any two human beings or hominids exchanged anything. A market economy does not define what capitalism is which is only 200 or 300 years old. Right. So clearly, exchanging things is not, is not, strictly speaking, capitalist. Well, they loved to exchange things, and they loved money, and they loved to turn that money into consumer goods, things down from the lowlands, dishes, dresses, especially tools, all the things they could not make themselves. People have always lived this way. There's nothing unusual about it. I wanted to interpret them as an agrarian economy and then use North America to depict the conflict, the collision between agrarian economy and capitalism, which is the new economy. Capitalism, that's the revolution. Yes, <laughs> it certainly is. And leading this revolution is a revolutionary, <laughs> right. Alexander Hamilton. Yeah. yeah. So this is the first inkling we have that this agrarian world and its you know, small-scale, self-sufficient economy is going to be threatened by this emerging capitalist order. And it comes in the form of, of Hamilton and his decision to tax whiskey, which triggers a subsequent revolt known as the Whiskey Rebellion, where people in the backcountry in Appalachia refuse to pay their tax. And it's, it's not just a tax revolt. It's not just people you know, being angry about having to pay taxes. It's much, much more than that on both sides. Hamilton sees the tax more than ju as just revenue, as you point out. And the people in the backcountry see it as more than just having to fork over a few coins. Tell us more about that. Well, Hamilton was the most talented political economist in North America. He is, of course, much different than the Broadway depiction of him. Yes, a self-made man. I, I, I wouldn't take it away from mm. him. He really was. Right. But at the same time, he had very particular, really extraordinary ideas about what a nation state would be. In some ways, Hamilton was one of the people who invented the modern nation state. And the way that he did that was he didn't think that a nation state was just its territorial boundaries, right? You draw a boundary, you defend it against enemies, and there you have it. There's your state. He knew that did not work. In order to have a truly functioning state, the government had to be integrated with its economy. And just as he and all the Federalists believed that the Constitution needed to operate the same way in New York City, as it did in Western Pennsylvania, right? Yep. Every single square mile of the United States had to be equally governed. He thought the same way about the economy. Everybody had to be part of the same economy. That meant they had to use money. And if he had his way, they would have used the same money, money that was minted by the United States. He didn't get his way on that but he at least wanted them to turn the value that they created from their labor and their land into this form of value that could be siphoned off into taxes. Taxes, I think in a powerful way, Hamilton believed made you a citizen. So you're quite right when you said, Ed, that it wasn't just a tax revolt. They were revolting against tax, but the tax was reaching in to their relationship with land in the form of whiskey. Now, you might say, some of the listeners might say, what is the big deal about whiskey? 
Yeah, it is a big deal. (laughs) I guess for a lot of people, it is a big deal. Don't come and take mine away from me. But whiskey, first of all, it was a stable form of something that they loved to grow, which was rye. In rye, you can feed to your pigs. You can make it into rye bread. But the third thing that you can do with it is you can turn it into whiskey. You can distill it into a form that won't degrade. It won't mold. It won't rot. That meant, just like silver and gold, because it didn't degrade, you could use it as a form of exchange itself. And people knew they could stockpile it. They could sell it next week. They could use it for an exchange next month. It would be the same. Isn't it another thing about whiskey that it's also, you're taking, you know, 300 pounds of rye and turning it into five gallons of of whiskey so that it becomes not only more valuable, but also very portable. Yes. You can put it on a mule and take it 200 miles to town or to a trading post. And that's where you get your tools and your plates and that sort of thing. Absolutely. It's value-added process that allows for that kind of exchange. Yeah. With whiskey, you could sell that to a merchant in the next city or with a connection to New Orleans, and what you get back from that is money. Taxing whiskey was taking that profit or a good size of it away from them. That influenced their relationship with the entire world beyond the mountains. That's one of the reasons that they got mad. And this idea of local and distant comes into play. So they dodge a bullet to a certain degree with Hamilton. The Whiskey Rebellion sort of fizzles out and Jefferson repeals the tax. But the threat from the outside and from the outside market forces are there, and they're only going to grow in the 19th century. And really, the next critical phase, as you point out in your book, is after the Civil War, when the United States plunges fully into the Industrial Revolution. And this turn to heavy industry, steel, railroads, requires an incredible supply of natural resources like lumber, oil, iron, and especially coal. And, it, you know, it doesn't take very long for industrialists to figure out that there's a region rich in all these things, Appalachia. But along with that, there's a big problem, which is that people live there. Thousands of these self-sufficient agrarians living lives that are really separate from the forces of rapid modernization that are transforming the U.S. And so the challenge for these industrialists and their agents becomes how to get this land from these people, you know, and they can do it in two ways, which you point out. One is to demonize the populace as, you know, impediments to progress. And the other is to use legal schemes and all kinds of other schemes to basically get them off their land. So could you tell us about this process by which, you know, the Industrial Revolution comes to Appalachia and it's really the great transformation and ultimately the great dispossession? Yeah. I think one effective way for listeners to understand it is that it was completely asymmetrical. You had corporations with engineers, managers, access to science and to machinery They could organize and think about the process for months, for years before they did anything. And they were facing a group of people who were relatively disorganized, had no information about the kind of larger picture that was being planned for their region. They just had no way to organize against it and to stop it. And to make it worse, the politicians who were supposed to be representing their interests and protecting them both locally, state, and nationally, very quickly realized that they were going to profit and were going to succeed in their own political careers to the extent that they would align themselves with industry. Right. Because there was so much money that was greasing the wheels of politics. And so they entered the mountains. And what I found was they went into county archives. They figured out who hadn't paid their property taxes. Right. They found the whole system to be unnerving, completely confusing, utterly illegible to them because there was an entire local language and series of relationships that they knew nothing about. Right. Weren't there lots of practices of sort of informal land transfer? You know, some people had titles, a lot of people didn't have titles. They had a lot of written documents, but there were sort of informal documents. And even those didn't necessarily correspond to actual deeds. So it's kind of a property mess. It was a mess. <laughs> we can leave it at that. Yeah. yeah, that these corporate interests are going to take advantage of, though. The fact that it's a mess and that they have all this knowledge and these, this legal talent, yeah. they're going to be able to crowbar these people off this land pretty quickly. Yeah, people would transfer land. What's, I'll tell you what's amazing about the mountain people, the Belcher family and the Tottens, who I learned the most about. And that is, you would think that they would do all their 
business with each other just on a handshake. Why would they need to write down a deed? They did. They documented right. everything. If someone was going to move into a house because there was a marriage, someone decided, well, they can take my house and I'll build another one. There was a deed written for the exchange. There might not have been any money that changed hands because they were making a household for a young family. Yeah. But they wrote a deed so that that couple would have a document proving ownership. Did they then record it with the county? Sometimes they did. Sometimes they didn't. So just as you said, the companies found this perplexing. And when they went to the courts for a good number of years, the courts were locally controlled. And they did much better, the the corporations did, in the state Supreme Court than they did in the local courts because those tended more often to side with the household. And the informal arrangements and... They did, until about 1890, when there was a kind of judicial revolution. And a lot of the judges who were more sympathetic to the mountain folk ended up, were out. And it was a new generation that came in, and they were staunchly pro-industry. So at about that time, at about 1883, is when the first shipments of coal from McDowell County, from the flat top coal fields, rolled out. And by about 1888, there was a vast coal field that had been assembled from land that was, people were intimidated. They sold their land for well below what it was actually worth. They lost it because the companies played a game of adverse possession where they would build a cabin and hire some other household to live on land that belonged to them in order for them to establish a claim. They were very smart and incredibly strategic. And they used a company called the Flat Top Land Trust. So there was sort of one big agent right. there that their job over a period of almost 20 years was to simply pick off one by one these yeah. pieces of property and to assemble them. And by, I think the year is 1889, they had assembled a 200,000 acre tract of land, lining it up for the coal companies to go in and burrow into the ground. And this is the big thing that triggers, like you say, coal country. In 1889, you cite a statistic that out of this, that particular county, 565,000 tons was unearthed. But just 13 years later, in 1902, it's 5.6 million. Yeah, so right. this is all made possible by you know, moving from small-scale coal digging to massive, heavy industry, heavily capitalized coal mining. That's really going to mark the future of places like West Virginia. Absolutely. And it required just armies of people. And this is how it intersects with their households as well. Remember, we said that they always love to use money. And money is something that they got when they produced whiskey or really later on, cattle. Money came from commodities that they got out of the woods. Right. Things that they didn't have to pay for except with their own labor. They used this ecological base and they could turn it into money. And that's how they could be free and the money served their interests and they didn't serve the money. But when they lost the woods because the coal companies were allied with lumber companies, and sometimes they were the same company, they came in and they clear-cut. It's not that Appalachia was all clear-cut in one day or one year. It wasn't. It was really like 20 years. But it was kind of hollow by hollow, valley by valley. It was just stripped. And when that was gone, they had no way to produce commodities themselves. Well, if they wanted to replace money in their economy, They had one thing that was offered to them. They could work for wages. They could turn their labor into money. They thought they could do that on their own terms as well. Mm -hmm. But in time, the wages became more important, so essential, and the demands on them became so great that there was nothing to do but to move down into the lumber camp, into the coal town, the coal camp, and basically live there full time. And even then, they held on. They said, Well, we're only doing this for a couple of months to make enough money to go back to buy our land back from the company. Right. So we can go back and do what we were doing. And they often met people who said, oh, yeah, we said that too. We've been here for three years. Yeah. Thinking of it as a stopgap measure that turned out to be a permanent status. And this status as workers, you know, these wage earning coal miners, it's really, as we know, really incredibly difficult, dangerous work. The pay is incredibly low. And to make their status even more difficult, They live in company villages, company housing, that the company can evict them from at any moment uh, in the middle of the winter if they dispute anything or if, God forbid, they try to form a union. And they also have to buy their things from company stores that charge certainly higher prices than they might have gotten on their own. So it's a really difficult, very 
yep. radically different kind of world that they enter into. And it's in some ways, you know, when you, if you step back from it, much of the story is about dispossession, but it's also about extraction, you know, and if you take a look at it at this moment, it's extraction on three levels. I mean, there's the extraction of the resources from the land. There's also incredible extraction of labor from these workers. And then the macro level, extraction of these resources from the states right. where the coal mining is taking place. I was in West Virginia about two years ago, and I was overlooking the Caford Mountain, which is this mountain that is no more. It's been completely eradicated with mountaintop removal. And the guy who was leading the group there said, and I don't know if his numbers are correct, but still the sort of broad picture is pretty arresting. He said, you know, since 1850, $5 trillion of value has been extracted from the state of West Virginia. And in 1850 and right now, it has always been one of the poorest states in the United States. You know, how is this possible? And his point was that all this money gets sucked out of the ground. Yeah. And in fact, today, it's still happening with incredible fracking that's going on, but it's taken out of state. So the state is impoverished. So it's extraction on three levels. That's a really good point and really well said. Capitalist peripheries are where the capital is basically produced, but not where it accumulates. It accumulates in a bank account in, you know, in New York City. Mm. So yeah, it produced billions of dollars, and yet it's one of the poorest places. How is that possible? The miners, they knew themselves. They understood exactly what role they were playing. They were reading the United Mine Worker. I was absolutely amazed at the United Mine Worker and just how deeply studied in economics and political economy its writers were. Mm -hmm. And also, it was one of the most, if not the most, radical newspaper in the United States. Right. Just remarkable. It is. And some of that's captured in the movie Mate Wan, which is still a movie I occasionally show to my students. It's not a perfect movie. It's, it's got its romanticized visions of interracial cooperation, but it still is a really powerful movie when it comes to sort of getting at the kind of desperate lives these people live in. They're living in company housing, yeah. losing their lives in dangerous conditions, and facing an incredibly hostile big coal alliance against forming a union. Right. Yeah, it's, it's right. quite a... You know, John Sayles lives in Guilford, Connecticut, where I am right now, where I live, and I really want to meet him. All right. Well, hopefully there'll be a <laughs> produce section moment where you're reaching for the baby carrots and you realize you're standing next to John Sayles. I want that. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be quite amazing. Well, what I want to make sure we get to, and you know, so this sort of explains that long story of the impoverishment, not just the poverty of Appalachia, but the actual impoverishment through these means. But let's jump up to today. I mean, it's still a very difficult place and difficult place to live. Coal is disappearing as an industry. Fracking is all over the place. It's really astonishing if you drive through West Virginia to see how much, I mean, fracking literally is under over every road, under over every hill. There are fracking wells within 150 feet of houses. It's just incredible. And then, of course, throw on top of that the opioid epidemic. So all of this is captured, I guess, in most people's minds in the bestseller Hillbilly Elegy, the, the memoir by J.D. Vance. And I know that in just reading about your book, that there's a lot of people that are sort of describing Ramp Hollow as the answer to J.D. Vance. And I know, being a historian myself, I know you didn't dash this book off in the last eight months. <laughs> it's been a long <laughs> work. But it does, it is an answer in a broad sense to the larger problem of talking about places like Appalachia as places without history. I think you actually paraphrase a, a sociologist or somebody who says, it's mistaking condition for culture, you know, mistaking poverty for something that is in essence or an essential part of these people. So tell us why this, why this story matters now and also a little bit more about your reflections on Hillbilly Elegy and what's missing in that story. Right. Well, I, I want to say about Vance that, you know, I really admire his accomplishment. Right. I always have to say that because as a memoir, you know, in some ways it's not fair. A memoir is beyond reproach. You can't criticize someone's life. And his story is, is a tremendous story. And that's most of the book. So what are people so... Some people are upset about it. Why are they upset about it? Because he raises his own memoir to a level in which he ends up blaming the poor of Appalachia for their own trouble. He may deny that he does that, but he really says that this is a culture in crisis. It's a culture of poverty, right? Without even realizing how hot button that term is, and it goes back to the social science of the 1960s, and African-Americans. It's a culture of poverty, and they just need to get their act together right. because he did, because he had a mentor, because he got out. And that was his solution. His solution was not to improve the life of Appalachia. He wants to make his own career. I understand that. But his solution was, I got out. Well, not everybody can get out, and not everybody has a grandmother 
like his grandmother, who sheltered him from the chaos of his family, gave him a place to study so he could become the person that he became. So there's history in that story, but it's just his history, his, his little micro version of yeah. the story, rather than the larger version that you're talking about that would really challenge those assumptions about, quote unquote, the culture of poverty and just finding a way to pull yourself up by your bootstraps because, exactly. because that's what I did. Well, one final thing about the book, you note in the introduction and in various places that we have these great assumptions about capitalism. Essentially, embedded in it is an optimistic progress narrative. And maybe you could close us out by talking a little bit about how that's problematic in the sense that it sort of gives us an idea of determinism, gives us an idea of capitalism as a natural thing, like capitalism is the same thing as gravity or the laws of thermodynamics that it just is. And that's a widely held view, especially I'm sure you hear it from your students. Yeah. And you have to say, no, capitalism is a construction and, and it also comes in 600 different varieties. And there are choices and possibilities within all of those varieties, and they still exist, many of those choices. Could tell us sort of your take on that issue with capitalism as we understand it today? It really is remarkably difficult to explain to people, and yet mm -hmm. it's, it's like the atmosphere that everybody swims in, and yet they don't see it. But there was something about the process of creating capital itself, where you would invest money in something that would end up perhaps to produce more money, you would have more than you ended up with. But instead of seeing that as a social process in which these people you compelled to work for you created that capital with their labor, you took the surplus value of their labor and then reinvested it. Mm -hmm. Or the, a technical process in which someone would invent a machine that would be more efficient. Instead of seeing those things operate in the actual material world, it became very easy simply to believe that there was a kind of spirit of progress that was working. Right. And so it was very easy for people to give this to some unnamed force of the universe or God to say that we live in this spirit of progress and in this era of progress and that capitalism is inherent to it. And so to the extent that we absorb this idea and see it as inevitable or to see it as the outcome of human evolution, or as an extension or an expression of our own human nature, I think that we become powerless. We become incapable of understanding it, criticizing it, and acting for our own interest. The worst thing that someone can do with regard to capitalism is simply believe that it itself is an outcome of evolution as surely as the size of our brains are. Right. If you believe that, then really there's nothing to be done. In fact, capitalism ceases to have a history at all. It just has always existed in, inherent in us. This is absolutely untrue. Right. And the guy who I've studied quite a bit and who makes a brief appearance in your book is Henry George. He's the subject of my most recent book. And Henry George had this famous book, Progress and Poverty. And really, in many ways, that book was taking on an earlier generation of economists who argue the laws of the economy are untouchable. Right. And he said that is just... That is a lie and a sin, and it is going to paint us into a terrible corner and destroy what we cherish, which is this republic. Yeah. So yeah. I guess uh, we need to reframe, if we're to move into the 21st century and retain what we revere about this country, rethinking capitalism or having a more yeah. informed understanding of what in fact it actually is and how human beings making choices impacts it. That's key. Yeah. Well... This has been a really fascinating and compelling conversation, Stephen. So thank you very much for taking the time and good luck with the book and making that case about history and choices and, and all of that. Thank you, Ed. I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed it. Stephen Stoll is author of Ramp Hollow, The Ordeal of Appalachia, just published by Hill & Wang and available everywhere. Well, citizens, we've reached the end of this episode of In the Past Lane. Thanks for listening. Let me know what you think of this episode and this podcast. Send your comments, questions, and suggestions along via Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Please also leave a starred review, even just a sentence or two, at Stitcher, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcasts. Reviews are really helpful for attracting new listeners. Thanks. If you want to learn more about this episode's topic, you'll find it at our website, inthepastlane.com. 
There you'll find a show page that has recommended readings, links, and show credits. Thanks to all the terrific people who make In the Past Lane possible. Thanks also to the Free Music Archive, which supplied most of the music for this episode. I'm In the Past Lane's host, Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, reminding you that history explains our world, so let's pay attention to it. Thanks for listening. We hope you'll join us next time for another journey in the past lane. Hey, Lulu, did you have fun at the party last night, marking the two-year anniversary of In the Past Lane? I was told there would be cake. SBI, Snoring Beagle International. (laughs) 